Special welcome to those that are visiting. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Uh, today's text that falls on the lectionary is this passage, this story that Jesus shares that has to do with money, 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 money. <laughs> Everyone knows there are a few hot button topics that can make any conversation go nuclear, right? That's why when Thanksgiving comes up, I know we're a ways off. But, you know, when so-and-so comes over, you know there's certain topics to stay away from, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, right? Well, you know, it could be like religion, health, politics, death. You know, but when it comes to the most difficult conversation you can possibly have, a new survey uh, from Wells Fargo and Company found out uh, who the clear winner was. Can you guess out of those... Things, religion, health, politics. Money, yeah. money, 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 money. That's right. Money landed at the top, says Karen uh, Wimbash, director of retail retirement for the Charlotte, North Carolina based bank. She says, I don't know that we expected that. It was kind of a surprise. I would have personally thought, you know, uh, death would have probably been up there, or maybe politics. In fact, 44% of Americans point to personal finances as the most challenging chat anyone can possibly have. Even the existentially terrifying topic of death, which you might expect, again, to top such a survey, comes in second at 38%. Also far behind are perennial explosive topics like politics at 35% and religion at 32%. So it doesn't take much of imagination to guess what we're going to talk about here this morning. Money, 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 right? In Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 13, Jesus tells a parable. He tells the parable of the dishonest manager. How many of you have heard that parable, that story that Hal just put before us before? Just raise your hand. I'm just curious to see. Yeah, this is kind of a familiar story, maybe not so familiar. But I, I guarantee you, if you go back and you look at the passage, it's a difficult story. I chose the New Living Translation to have it read to you all because I think that translation captures uh, what I think Jesus is saying. But there's a lot of discussion and various interpretations as to what Jesus is actually saying. It's, in other words, it's a complicated passage to interpret. Now, as was put before us, you, you know the story. There was a boss or a rich man who had a manager. And he, and he found out that he was losing money. And he was going to fire the manager. So the manager, before he gets fired, goes out to all those people that he was collecting for. And he asks them, what did they owe the boss? And they would say, you know, a high number. And then, and then the manager would cut it down, right? Say, so, well, let's do this. And then he did the same thing. Wheat, oil, etc. When the story begins to wrap up, the boss finds out. And the boss says, hey now, that was pretty smart. That was pretty shrewd. And then the curtain drops. It kind of left wondering a few things. And then the Lord gives a few teachings and he gives a few uh, words. And we're going to kind of look at those words together so that we can kind of uncover what I think to be a very important parable because it speaks to those of us living in a consumer capitalist society where money is really central to how we think about ourselves, how we think about our community, how we think about our life. And so it really does touch a nerve for us. What's the pastor going to say? How is he going to interpret this passage, right? <laughs> well, let's, let's explore this together. But again, I want to tell you that the story does raise challenges for interpretation. Is, is Jesus praising the dishonest manager? That would be kind of weird, right? Jesus is praising 
Is he praising the dishonest manager? Is Jesus saying that unbelievers are smarter than believers? Is he trying to say, you know, these, you know, these people of the world are smarter than you sons of light, sons and daughters of the light? The implication is, get with it. Start being a little shrewd, like the world. And, and why would the master praise his dishonesty if the reason for firing him in the first place was his Right, and it's, see where the challenge, some of you are starting to see. There's some challenges here. How do we understand this? And what de debts are being canceled? Was the manager sneaking and adding debts and taking, taking off basically what he was getting? Or was he adding the debts to the actual, to the boss's uh, ledger? Whose debts were being uh, skimmed off? Because that affects how you understand the story. And also, what about the landowners? Are they poor farmers? Because if they're poor farmers, then we have to interpret the story differently. Or are they involved in agribusiness, what we would call agribusiness? That is, they're not simply poor. They're, they're wealthy, and they, they are involved in this whole scheme and understand the costs. So we're not really told, so we don't really know how to approach. So there's lots of things hanging here, and there's uh, some questions. We need Jesus' comments on the parable to get a grasp as to what's going on. He makes two comments, one in verse 8 and the other in verse 9. Hopefully I've kind of um, at least got your curiosity going so that you may be thinking, what is, what is Jesus trying to say here? Well, let's look at verse 8. He says these words. He says, the sons of this world, that is, unbelievers, people who don't follow Jesus, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Now, I don't think Jesus is saying, and that's great. And that's great. Now, you Christians can learn a thing or two about being clever from dishonest folk like this manager. Right? I don't think that's what's going on. Rather, I think Jesus is saying something like this. It may be true that people in this world may be shrewd and may be clever when it comes to wheeling and dealing in worldly matters. But guess what? Who cares? It cannot compare to the wisdom I will teach you regarding how to use money in securing your eternal future. In other words, the manager may have been smart in using money, right, to secure uh, temporal affairs, but Jesus is going to teach us how to use money in a way that will secure eternal affairs. That is, our eternal destiny. Not so smart in the stock market? Don't worry about it. You have an internal investment. I have a friend who got involved in stocks and really, you know, was into the stocks. And when you are into the stocks, what are you doing all the time? What are you checking all the time? What are you looking at all the time, right? They're looking at the numbers. Are they going up? Are they going down? They go, you know, what's happening? And there is kind of a kind of wisdom that's needed to, to wheel and deal in the stock market. But many of us just don't do that. Maybe we're missing out. Here, Jesus is saying, don't worry about it. You have an internal investment that won't expire, unlike those who are going to lose it in about 80 years or so. This leads to a second comment in verse 9. He says this, And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth. This is where different Bible uh, translations have different ways of trying to interpret this phrase. Uh, Jesus is talking about mammon. It's, it's an Aramaic word. It has to do with money, but it's money cast it's in a negative light. It's described in a negative way. So he says, but he says to make friends. You see how this is confusing? Make friends with that which is dishonest. It's a weird, it's a weird passage. Make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into eternal homes. What? <laughs> huh? Let me paraphrase what I think is going on. This is, what I, this is kind of how I would rephrase. Uh, you think you're shrewd. You think you're clever. Here's what's really shrewd and clever. Make for your sins, uh, yourself friends of worldly wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. 
isn't it all clear now for you? <laughs> that was supposed to be clarifying? Stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Notice the word eternal. This is a clue. It's kind of unlocking, I think, the meaning of the passage. Notice the word eternal. Jesus brings an eternal perspective. Okay? Jesus brings an eternal perspective. He's saying, do more with your money than secure your temporal dwelling place. Right? Do more with your money than secure your temporal dwelling place. That's all this guy could do. That's all he could do. He could only use his money to secure a temporal dwelling place. Jesus is saying, use your money to secure an eternal dwelling place. This is what makes Jesus' wisdom better than the manager's. Okay? I once saw a bumper sticker that said, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Right? That's the worldview of our world. All that matters is all that matters. All that matters is matter because there's only the universe. It's only made of matter. One day you're going to die. You'll cease to exist. Game over. Therefore, the one who dies with at least a few houses, maybe two, three, four, five, six, maybe, uh, lots of square footage, has great teeth in their coffin, so that when everyone goes to their funeral, says, wow, they have great teeth. <laughs> wow, look at the tone in their arms. They were able to look really fit all the way to the end. That's great, right? That's essentially it, right? That's a materialistic worldview. That's a temporal worldview. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, the author says, that's what life is like under the sun. Meaningless, meaningless. No ultimate meaning under the sun. Above the sun, that's the eternal perspective. If your perspective is under the sun, the one who dies with the most toys wins. But if your perspective is above the sun, there is a God. There is a God. There is a triune God. There is a Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There is a eternal life, right? Death is not the end. And we can say that because we believe Jesus Christ rose from the dead and verified all his claims about God and faith. And if Jesus Christ rose from the dead, death isn't the end. Amen? We can amen that, even though it's not Easter, okay? <laughs> Every day is Easter for the Christian. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That's why I believe in life after death. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, I wouldn't believe in life after death. I'll tell you that right now. I just wouldn't believe in life after death. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead. There's life after death. And so we have to have a eternal perspective. This is what makes Jesus' wisdom better than the manager's. It doesn't leave us homeless in eternity. Right? It doesn't tell us the one who dies with the most toys wins is the philosophy that we should live by, which is the philosophy that our consumer culture lives by. Right? It doesn't leave us homeless in eternity. The wisdom of Jesus doesn't do that because it doesn't focus us solely and totally on our 401k. Jesus is telling us how to have a home for eternity, a dwelling of joy, a dwelling of companionship with others that will last forever. But how? How? By making friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth. There's that weird statement again. How does, make, how does one make friends of the world of worldly wealth that is money? Here it is. It's by using it in a way that helps other people. It's by using it in a way that helps other people. This is the deeper wisdom of wealth. Money, you see, used solely for ourselves, fails in eternity. Whereas money used with others in mind does not. You remember the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 12, verse 33, he says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old. With a treasure in the heavens that, notice, does not fail. Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Or no stock market crashes. Or no recession can affect, right? Or no one can cyber hack into, right? We could add some others there. Because, of course, many of you probably aren't worried about moths getting into your 
into your money account, right? <laughs> Eating your dollar bills, right? All right, so let's contextualize a little, see? The word fail is the same Greek word that we find in today's text in chapter 16, verse 9, where he says, treasure in the heavens that does not fail. It's the same Greek word. So kind of we shape our understanding around what Jesus is getting at. Jesus is saying temple riches fail because they're focused solely on the here and now. But riches used with an eternal mindset are being stored up in heaven. And, and that takes into account other people. That takes into account other needs. Now, when I look around this congregation, many of you are generous. Many of you are putting your money where your mouth is. Uh, we're able to continue this ministry and the ministry here because of the generosity of others. And I'm so grateful and so thankful for that. Beloved, when we use our money and wealth to help others, we show that we have faith in God, right? We may even help lead others to Christ by how we spend our money and how we use our money. One of the things that was really uh, that really made an impact on me when I lived in, in Dallas, in Texas, many of you know we lived there for many years. Um, I taught at a private school, it was a very affluent school. A lot of the kids were driving, you know, would come in, freshmen, sophomore, driving Mercedes and BMWs, right? And uh, mom and dad, they just had a lot of money, but you wanna know something? Those kids weren't getting a free ride. As I got to know the students in the classrooms, and I got to know a lot of the parents, parents had great values in teaching their kids about the value of money by being generous. Because a lot of those parents were very generous to the school. They see what they were doing? And they were using their wealth to impact the ministry that they believed was so valuable, pouring into the next generation, not just knowledge about the world, but knowledge about God. It was a private school. So the kids were getting an eternal perspective. And these very wealthy uh, families, not all of them, but many of them, were very, very, very generous. Sometimes very rich people are very generous and real poor people are, poor people are not. You know, don't think that, I know a lot of times you can read the New Testament and you think that rich, bad, poor, good, you know? But guess what? There's a lot of poor people that are really stingy and, and rich people that are very giving, right? Are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay, good. I want to make sure I say that because I don't want people to feel like, you know. Jesus is really helping us to see how do we use money? How do we use money? When we use money and wealth to help others, we show our faith in God. We may even, again, help up lead others to Christ through generosity, whether we know it or not. And these people may precede us to glory and guess what? May even welcome us into our heavenly dwelling. And perhaps that's the meaning of the statement they may receive you into eternal dwellings. This leads us to what I believe to be the main idea of Jesus' parable. So if you, have, if you were asleep the whole time and you just woke up, guess what? You got it. Here it is. This is what I think is going on. Don't worry about being a shrewd investor. Don't worry about being a shrewd investor in the things of this world. Instead, be a shrewd investor in people's lives. Of course, we can invest in others relationally, can't we? We can invest in others relationally with our time and our talents, but the context here suggests that we know how to do it with our money. With our money, 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 money. You know, the very next parable that Jesus tells is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. You know that story, right? That was a story about what happens when we fail to notice the needy and the poor. The first three parables before today's parable is about a lost coin, a lost, oh uh, gosh, a lost coin, a lost son, and what's the other one? A lost what? sheep, right? Thanks for helping me. Nobody helped me. <laughs> a lost sheep, a lost coin. I'm, I'm, this, is not, this is not my notes. I had to use my memory. Okay? Which means I did study the passage, you know, the context. Lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. Value those things that are lost. Value the lost. Value the lost. And also, don't forget... That value relationship, don't let money rob you from having an eternal perspective. That's why he tells the last two parables here, these other two parables, about the manager, and the next one is the rich man and Lazarus. Know how, because there's a consequence, is the point. Some questions to consider maybe today for you are, are you investing in eternal things or just temporal things? Maybe you need to be reminded this morning. Maybe you're so focused on buying this or that and having to get this and that for health or, or for, for whatever it is, for the house. Maybe today is just kind of a, 
a, a good reminder, exhortation for you to really start to see, am I using my money with this eternal mindset? Am I valuing others as I spend money? How may we be valuing money more than people? How may I be valuing money more than people? How may you be valuing money more than people? How can we use our money in ways that show we value others more than ourselves? These are good questions for us to consider as we conclude this morning. Uh, let, me, let me end with a thought experiment. Suppose you buy shares of General Motors. What happens? You suddenly develop an interest in GM, right? You check the financial pages, you see a magazine article about GM, and you read every word, even though a month ago you would have passed right over it. Or suppose you're giving to help African children with AIDS, and when you see an article on the subject, you're hooked. If you're sending money to plant churches, maybe in India, and an earthquake hits in India, you watch the news, right? You fervently pray. What's the point? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Maybe you're saying to yourself right now, I don't really care about eternal things, but, but, but I want to. What can I do? Well, maybe you can relocate some of your money from temporal things to eternal things. Put your resources, your assets, your money and possessions, your time and talents and energies, not just on yourself or your family, but into the things of God, whatever that may be or whatever that may look like. And watch what happens. Pay attention to what happens as you do this, because you will discover, I think, the blessing and prove the words of Jesus that it is indeed better to give than to receive. Money leads, hearts follow. Don't worry about being a shrewd investor in the things of this world. Instead, be a shrewd investor in people's lives. Amen? Amen. 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 Father God, help us to do this. This is a challenge for us, those of us who have been, all of us, uh, blessed, uh, living in a time and in a country where we are indeed uh, the richest people on the planet, uh, comparatively speaking, to those around the world. It is, it is easy to get caught up in the wealth uh, and the blessing and forget to have an eternal perspective. So we thank you for this teaching of Jesus that arrests our hearts and, and reminds us and highlights for us what is truly shrewd, what is truly wise, and what is truly good. We thank you for that reminder. And all of God's people said... Amen. Amen. I promise you that wasn't just a 20, 25 minute prelude to the offering that we're about to take. Okay? But, be that as it may, may I invite the ushers up as we take up our offering.